We're in Acts chapter 9. Open your Bible there, please. Acts 9. This is kind of the, uh, the beginning of this chapter for us. Let's start with prayer, shall we? Father, we open our hearts to you this morning in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together, to dig into the word, to worship together, to fellowship, to pray. We ask in Jesus' name that the ministry of your Holy Spirit would be active here today, touching hearts, opening minds and hearts, filling us, Lord, with everything we need to be nourished and equipped to be into the world this week, shining the love of Christ. Be with us, we pray. Minister grace among us. Teach us and guide us, we ask, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 7, you'll remember, introduced us to a character uh, by the name of Stephen, who eventually, as we read, was uh, murdered by the Jews because of his testimony uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we started chapter 8. We saw that it opened with the words that Saul... Uh, approved of uh, Stephen's execution. And that execution, that, that, that murder of, of Stephen, started a landslide of persecution against the believers. They began to scatter all over the region. Uh, most of the last chapter that we looked at, chapter 8, dealt with that, the beginnings, I guess, of that scattering. We read about how Philip took the gospel uh, up into Samaria and there saw an explosion of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ and it was all very exciting we also saw how he uh, was used of the Lord to share the gospel with a particular Ethiopian eunuch uh, who came to Christ and and was baptized on the spot and that was all very cool and now we return here in chapter 9 to the source really of the persecution that broke out against the believers and really it's all coming most of it is coming from a man named Saul and in chapter 9, we see that it begins by saying, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. There's some interesting things, really, in just these first two verses. First of all, we see that, that he was asking, Paul was, I should say he's still Saul at this point, is asking for letters to, uh, for the synagogue at Damascus, which of course is the Jewish place of worship, which tells you that at this point in time, the early Christians were still fellowshipping right alongside uh, the, uh, the Jews, uh, the rest of the Jews, I should say. And, and they, they, again, I've mentioned this before to you guys, the early Christians didn't see a separation between Christianity and Judaism. <laughs> there was, you know, we, we see that today when, when people are talking about, you know, the different faiths, you know, they say, well, there's Judaism and then there's Christianity. The early Christians saw no separation. They were Jews. They had always been Jews. They had been brought up with the understanding of the God of the Hebrews who prophesied or spoke through the prophets, I should say, of the coming of Messiah, and they just believed the scriptures related to those prophecies. And they embraced the Jewish Messiah. And so for them, they were moving on in their Judaism. They didn't see it as Christianity. It wasn't, to them, it wasn't Christianity. It was moving on in Judaism. It was moving on in the faith of the Jews, the, the, the God of the Hebrews, the God of the universe. And so it, it was the most natural thing in the world for the early Christians to amalgamate their Christian faith along with their Judaism. And, and that means, you know, they kept the Sabbath and they went to synagogue and they did all the things that they ever did. And that's one of the things that causes people today to have such issues with understanding, the, the, frankly, the uh, Christian's relationship to the law of Moses. 
because they'll 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 say, well, the early the early Christians kept the Sabbath. Why don't we? You know, say, well, the early Christians were Jews and they were just following along in their Judaism. There was nothing different. It was over a period of time that those things began to be recognized. When I say those things, I mean, frankly, the, the elements of the law began to be recognized as fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, just as he said. He said, I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. In other words, fill it up. I, I, I'm going to show you why all those things were, were given to you by my Father uh, over the course of all those years and so forth. And, and, and anyway, so that's, you can see that's what's going on here. The, the, the second thing that I want to make a point about is that Saul is making his way to Damascus. And the reason that's significant is that the, the, Damascus was not next door to Jerusalem. And, and so he's, he's not letting anything limit him from his task of rooting out these Christians, arresting them, bringing them back to Jerusalem where he, they will be tried and punished for their belief in this Jesus of Nazareth character. Let me show you on the screen. This is, I found a map. And this is uh, kind of an interesting map because it's more of a modern map. You know what's interesting about modern maps? When we look at Bible towns and cities and places, they're still the same. It's been 2,000 years and they're still there. The, what I'm showing you here is basically a route that would have been taken from Jerusalem to Damascus. Damascus is in Syria. And, and, and so, you know, th th this, was, this was a long journey. Oh, the, the, you probably can't see it, but this is a Google map. And in the very middle of that route there, you might not be able to see it. I have to actually make it go bigger, but it's like four and a half well, four hours and 53 minutes by car. Now, imagine that by foot. But that's, doesn't, that's not stopping Saul. He doesn't care how, how far this is, how long it is, and how arduous the journey is. He wants those Christians. And they need to be punished. Because you see, in, in, in Saul's mind, what they were doing was treasonous. It was blasphemous. And he wanted them gone. He was there approving the death of Stephen, and he would have approved the deaths of any others at the same time. Let's keep reading verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Oh, here we go. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Oh, this is so good. But I want you to be careful not to, to miss a very important statement that is made in this uh, little short exchange between uh, Saul and Jesus. And it has to do with Saul being told who he's really persecuting. Because, you see, he's out to get these Christians who say they believe in Jesus of Nazareth. But, but did you notice that two times in this very short exchange, Jesus told him who he really was persecuting. First of all, in verse 4, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then when Saul asks who is speaking in verse 5, the Lord responds by saying, I am Jesus, look at this, whom you are persecuting. Isn't that interesting? I find that interesting. I find it very interesting. It's interesting that Jesus didn't say, I am Jesus, and you're persecuting my people. Or you're persecuting my church. Or you're even persecuting my children, my family. He doesn't say that. The persecution is personal. And it is ultimately toward the Lord himself. And so that's what he brings out. Here's the question. How should we understand this statement? Because it's a very interesting one. Well, I think we should see it alongside what the man who is being spoken to, Saul, later the Apostle Paul, went on to write about 
Because when he got around to writing a letter to a church that was started in Ephesus, he spoke of this dynamic that, he, that we're reading about here in the book of Acts. Let me put this on the screen. From Ephesians 5.23, it says, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, when you see the word head there in that verse, I want you to be careful not to think about that as we would say the head of security. All right? That's not what he's talking about. He's actually using the imagery of a human body, just like your human body. And he is saying that when there is a body, there must be a head. And Jesus, we are the body of Christ, and he is the head. And again, sure, he has that authority, but that's not all that it means. It means he's connected to the body, right? Just like your head is connected uh, to your body. And just like your body is made up of, you know, the, the torso and arms and legs and mouth and, and, and feet and all the other things that, that, that are connected to it, you also have a head, of course, and, and, and we do as the body of Christ, and Jesus is that head. And, and it's that same imagery that Paul uses when he goes on in another passage here. In chapter 4, he says, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him, that's Jesus, who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, again, we're using the imagery of a human body here, joined and held together by every joint from which it is equipped, or with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So there's that, that same imagery of a, of a human body. We are the body together, collectively. We are the body, right? We just happen to be the body. Some of the body is in heaven uh, with the Lord. Some of the body is here on earth. You're part of the body that's still on earth. And, and, and Jesus is in both places. Well, let me ask you a question. When your body gets hurt, or when you're, when you're sad, or when you feel pain, uh, is your head aware of it? It's <laughs> a ridiculous question. Of course, of course. But the, here's the point. He feels what we feel. He is not disconnected and aloof, sitting up there in heaven kind of going, well, I'm sure we're just waiting for the timer to go off so I can go back down there, you know, and uh, take care of things and get things, you know, back into order. Meanwhile, we're just going to kind of keep chilling up here in heaven, you know. No, 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 no. He's, he's connected. He's here. He's involved. He's feeling what you feel. He's feeling what we feel. He's experiencing what we are experiencing. He is not disconnected. He's the head. The head feels everything. And so what does he say to Saul? I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. It's personal. Changes how we think a little bit, doesn't it? Now it goes on to say in verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So here's, here's Saul. You know, he gets knocked to the ground, blinded, humbled, and then he has to be led into Damascus. So he's obviously not far. He's probably not far from Damascus by this time. And, and so he's led into Damascus where he goes into the home of a, of a person and uh, he, he, he spends three days, three days, Fasting, no food, no drink, no nothing. Now you'll remember back in verse 6 what the Lord told him was, he said, rise and go into the city and you'll be told what you should do. It's been three days. How long are you good at waiting for direction? I'm, I'm, I can handle about three minutes without getting antsy. He's on day three, blind. No food, no drink, 
I, I, I try to imagine what was going on in his heart and mind during those three days. Well, we're actually going to find out what he was doing during those three days. As we read on, look at verse 10 and following. It says, Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision. Uh, excuse me. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Well, I love this. I mean, I just, this whole narrative makes me smile. But this is where we find out what Saul was doing those three days. And the Lord just simply said to Ananias this, For behold, he is praying. He's praying. Now, I want you to think about the significance of that statement, if I could, just for a moment. Can I? Because I want you to remember something. Saul was not just a Jew. Saul was a very religious Jew. Saul was a man who had been educated at the feet of a man named Gamaliel, a very famous rabbi. Saul was a man who had himself become a rabbi, uh, excuse me, well, yeah, he was considered a rabbi in a very real sense of the word, but he was, he was most importantly to him, a Pharisee. So he's, he's, he's a Pharisee, which is the strictest form of Judaism. Now, as a Pharisee, I have absolutely no doubt that Saul was there every time the Jews gathered for prayer. And they gathered three times a day for prayer. Morning, afternoon, and evening prayer. So here's, here's, you know, here's the point. Saul was, was no stranger to prayer. He, he prayed. He prayed a lot. He prayed, prayed, been praying all his life. And yet, you sense as you read this, there's something different going on, don't you? As the Lord is speaking to Ananias about what's going on with Saul, there, there's, there's a new something happening. Saul is praying now with a, with a new heart. He's got a, a completely different perspective about life and about prayer and, and, and about, uh, you know, the, the God who he uh, had felt that he was serving with all of his heart because now the Lord is saying, of Saul, a man who had spent probably his lifetime praying, he's saying now, behold, he's praying. I wonder how many of us, before we knew the Lord, you know, shot up quick prayers whenever we were scared or <laughs> in need uh, in, in some particular way when the moment arose, you know, like we tended, I'm sure, to do, some of us, before really walking with the Lord. But then I wonder this. I wonder how after we truly bowed the knee and embraced Jesus as our Savior, how God listened and said, Behold, he's praying. Or behold, she's now praying. You know? Because it was now it was real. It was genuine. It wasn't just a quick, I need, like you put a coin in a vending machine. It's now a relationship of the heart that says, God, I need you. I, I didn't know, but I, now I know. I need you. Behold, he's praying. Now, Ananias isn't quite so sure about these marching orders that he's getting from the Lord. Look at verse 13 with me. It says, but Ananias answered, Lord, I've, I've, I've heard a few things about this, this character and how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. So the word had already spread all the way north up to Damascus about what Paul was, uh, Saul had been doing as it relates to the persecution of the church. And he goes on to say in verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priests to, to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, and I love this, it's just kind of this calm, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer 
for the sake of of my name, so here's this is this is the Lord's, you know, uh, declaration of the of the the calling that He has placed upon Saul's life. He says, "I don't know. I've, he's 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 my chosen instrument." How strange that must have sounded to Ananias' ears. Can you imagine, you know, to 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 have been on the receiving end as the body of Christ to so much hurt and pain and evil and and persecution from this man, and the Lord goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, he's my chosen instrument." You know, it's kind of like, Lord, are we, are we talking about the same guy here? Because we've been hearing about a, a, a Saul of Tarsus. Is there another? Is there another Saul of Tarsus? Maybe, the, 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 maybe you got your wires crossed. I, I, there's this guy named Peter down there in Jerusalem. and he, Why don't you just use him? He's good. He, and, and there's a bunch of others too. In fact, there's, uh, Jesus picked a bunch of guys. I'm sure though any of those will do just fine. This guy is, a, is, is rabid. You know? <laughs> he's evil. No, no, no. He's my chosen instrument. I, I, I want you to think about that, people. Because the reason, the reason I want you to think about it is because I, I, I run into so many Christians who just have the hardest time thinking of God using them. For whatever reason. And, and it, it could be because they have a past life of sin or just because they, like, like Moses, they feel like they have so many limitations or whatever the issues might be. But people struggle with the idea that God might have a calling upon their life. And we're like, oh, God can use a person like me. <sighs> Let me tell you. You, you, know, you just read through your Bible and you'll see the people that God can use. The people... You know, Paul would actually go on to say, who are the people that God chooses? Are they the strong and mighty and, and rich and famous and stuff like that? No, no. People that God uses, you know, they're the people that most of the world looks at and goes, well, they don't even look at them. They don't even notice them because they're the nobodies, the nothings. You know, those are the people God uses. People like you and me. Well, you might have noticed that the Lord also said something else to Ananias about Saul, and that was, he said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And during Paul's life on earth, he was continually shown how much he must suffer for the name of Jesus. You know, it's interesting. When Paul was writing his letter to the Galatians, it was, a, it was a hard letter to write, a very hard letter. It was corrective and it was confrontational. And I bet it was even harder for the people of Galatia to read it because it, they basically got spanked. I mean, it was, it was Paul spanking the church and, and confronting them with their propensity to run off after false teachers and begin even to embrace a false gospel. And, um, and so he has had some really hard things. But what I really find interesting is how he ended that letter. I want you to look at it on the screen from Galatians 6.17. Listen to this, listen to this. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Boom. That's called, well, it's what Paul referred to as his scars of authenticity. And that's the way he looked at it. He looked at his suffering and the scars that came from that suffering as literally a badge of authenticity. Don't let, don't let anybody bother me. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. In other words, the sufferings that I have borne for the name of Jesus. And he spoke about those sufferings. Here's where we get to 2 Corinthians. And he begins to talk and he says, imprisonments, you name it, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. <laughs> wow. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. You know, it got to the point where when Paul spoke of his ministry, he would speak of persecution as if they were essentially one and the same thing. Ministry and persecution. Ministry, pers he didn't see a difference. Let me show you this interesting statement from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, a wide door for effective work is open to me. That's ministry. And there are many adversaries. That's persecution. It was, it was all one statement. It was all the, a single statement for Paul. Ministry, persecution, goes together. Goes together. It's the way he saw it. He didn't expect one without the other. Verse 17, look with me in your Bible. So, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, notice what he says <laughs> to Saul. This is the enemy. This is the evil enemy. And he calls him Brother Saul. That's a, that's a, that's a Christian term. That's, they would use that for those who were in the faith. Brother Saul, he says, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by the way. And in verse 18 says, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. And by the way, it says scales fell from his eyes. This is just my personal belief. It's just my opinion, okay? But when Paul later wrote to the Corinthians in his second letter and he talked about a thorn in the flesh, it is my personal opinion, it was a disease of the eyes. Because he actually said to the Galatians, he says, it was because of an illness that I came to you in the first place. And he says, you received me like you would receive God himself. In fact, he says, I know that had you been able, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And then later in some of his letters, when he would end the letter, you know, Paul dictated his letters. But he would always write the last line in his own hand because that was his sign of authenticity, that it was really from Paul. And he would say at the end of his letter, see what large letters I use as I write with my own hand. I think Paul had a disease of the eyes. I don't think Paul ever got over that issue of being blinded by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And it was a reminder. And that's what Paul called it. He said, in order to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. In other words, to keep my feet on the ground, it's like, Paul, remember that you were Saul of Tarsus and you were on your way to destroy my church and I changed you in the blink of an eye and you became the Apostle Paul. And so thus begins the death of one man and the new life of another because we read there in, in the end of verse 18 that he rose and was baptized. And what we see there is that, that Paul submitted to water baptism as a way of signifying the death of the old life and the rising up, the raising up of the new life. And that's what water baptism symbolizes. I hope you know. It's not just getting dunked. It's not just getting wet. It's not just going through the motions. It signifies the death of the old life and the beginning of the new because we lay back in the water, death in the water, burial up out of the water, resurrection. But it's resurrection unto new life today, living a new life today. It's the old man, the old woman saying, you're down, you're dead. We have, I have come to Jesus 
And Paul, I mean, you know, you guys remember the famous chapter, Romans chapter 6, we'll get to it eventually. Paul's going to say, don't you know that we who are baptized, were baptized into his death? Don't you know that? The old man, the old woman died. We left it behind. And the symbolism of baptism is that we've been raised up, washed clean, now ready to live a new life. The reason I share a little bit of that with you is not just to tell you about what it meant to Paul, but just to also let you know that you probably noticed the tank over here. In second service, we have 19 people we're baptizing. 19. And some of them are older than me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, which just thrills me, I'll tell you. But for those of you that can't stick around, for second service, and, and it's going to be full, let me just tell you. Uh, you might consider, you know, if you've are you got to go home and do something, go home and turn on your computer or your TV and watch on YouTube and watch us baptize 19 people in second service. It's going to be fun. Uh, because, because what's going on is that, that for 19 people, they're going through that depiction of the death of the old life. And the rising up of the new. I, I sometimes wish that we could do what happened to the Apostle Paul. I wish we could, we could give people a new name once they get baptized, you know, once they come to the Lord, you know. Wouldn't that be cool just to kind of signify the fact that the old one's dead. Now you got a new name. Well, the Bible says we actually are going to get a new name in the book of Revelation. It says we'll be given a new name. So it'd be cool if we had it now, but, you know, I guess I'll wait. I'm not, like I said, I'm not good at waiting, but, you know. Anyway, let's stand and we'll pray. If you need prayer, of course, you are more than welcome to come down. We'd love to pray with you. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the beauty of your word. Thank you for the blessing of being able to, 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 to sit under you, Lord, our teacher, our instructor, the nourisher of our soul. And we praise you and we thank you for the good things that you're doing in all of our lives. And we just open our hearts to you that the ministry of your grace would continue to fill us as we look to you to accomplish that very thing. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your Sunday.